Where have we been? Well, boom, Patmos, John's there getting a vision that becomes the book of Revelation, ships it off to circle around these seven churches. We mentioned a, a few of them this morning, and you guys, regular attenders at adult Sunday school, had a little bit of, a, little bit of a leg up on other people. It's okay. Oops. I'm tangled. We said uh, Ephesus is a big port city, and kind of being a major stop at real... Christians have a real you know, issue with Caesar worship and, and, and temple worship there in Ephesus. Same went for Smyrna, another you know, major port city, big stop. So you kind of have the, all the bells and the whistles of the Roman, <coughs> Roman world set up there. We've also got Pergamum way up top. That's where the, the temple to Asclepios we mentioned this morning is. Some other uh, temples to Greek gods. So again, you, you've got this real kind of potent uh, pressure on Christians. Thyatira is where Lydia is from in the book of Acts, dealer of purple cloth, Thyatira. And you've also got um, Sardis. So we met those two more, more blue-collar towns. Um, I think I said that wrong in the sermon. Thyatira was the blue-collar one. Um, where buying and selling and trading was difficult for Christians, as we encountered this morning. Uh, and Sardis used to be a kind of a big fortress, but... They had kind of fallen asleep and letting themselves be overtaken on two different occasions. So we said, hey, we're not just an attractional church. We can't just sit in our pews and say, ah, we're good enough the way we are. We've got to be a missional church. We have to be outward facing. We have to you know, have a watchman. You know, you wish you could go back and tell the city of Sardis that. You've got, you got to keep looking. You've got to keep doing your due diligence. Uh, today we're going to Philadelphia. Uh, it's a word we know, Right? Because Pennsylvania has a Philadelphia. The Eagles play there. What else do I know? There's a bell with a crack in it. Um, is that where the one if by land, two if by sea thing happens? I'm not very good at history. Is it? Or is that Boston? It would make sense because there's not a C near Philadelphia. So I could have probably got there on my own. Original capital. This is not that one. So ignore all the facts we just said. This is a Philadelphia in Asia. So we're going to be reading from Revelation 3, 7 through 13 this morning, if you've got your own Bibles. <clears throat> and we're almost done, because there's only Laodicea after this, so we've got this week and next, and we're out of here. Have a little break from adult Sunday school, probably until, um, probably until January or February. We've got all Advent and Christmas program stuff in here soon, so... To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, this is Revelation 3, 7 through 13. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, we know that one, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, since you have kept my command to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. To him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So by now, we've got a lot of repeat stuff, a lot of stuff that we've encountered before. We expect this to be true if it's written to a, you know, real people in a real place and time that have some similarities to these people all part of the Roman Empire dealing with some of the same struggles and challenges. And that's exactly what we find. 
I just kind of want to march through this section by section. We begin this, this really interesting thing about the key of David. So if you remember back to, to the initial introduction, I don't expect you to remember this. Uh, we said that each uh, address to the church begins with a, an attribute of Jesus, a title for Jesus that was given him in Revelation 1. And one of those titles that Jesus has in Revelation 1 is the one who holds the key of death and Hades. The one who holds the key of death and Hades. Well, we find this theme of this key for this place kind of crop out throughout the book of Revelation. So here we have the key of David. We also encountered uh, when those locusts came up, remember that angel was given the key to the abyss and he unlocked it. That was when we were looking at the seven trumpet judgments. So there's a key to the abyss that is given and, and these demon locusts come out of it. We also saw, speaking of the abyss, just last week in chapter 11, when we saw the two witnesses who represent for us the church, that at the end of their, their time of protection and thriving, a beast came out of the abyss and attacked them, and it looked as though they were dead before God put them back on their feet. Now today, we also encountered a beast that came out of the sea, a dragon that came out of the sea, another beast that came out of the land, and when we look ahead to Revelation chapter 20, we're again gonna be confronted with this idea of the key to the abyss. So Satan, it says, is thrown into the abyss and, and it is locked, he's locked in the abyss. So what is meant by this image of, of the key? And what is meant by this idea of the abyss? Well, abyss is a word for the Greeks of this time that is, is meant as the place for evil spirits. Not unlike the word Hades that we've talked about at Sunday school before. A place where kind of evil dwells. It's also understood to be something like um, a bottomless pit could be used. The abyss is a bottomless pit or a, a pit at the bottom of the sea, okay? So uh, kind of in keeping with this morning, Satan being hurled down, it's meant to designate a spatial difference, right? There's kind of a lower abyss. That means you're limited. You're away from us. You're held at bay. And then there's the world, and then there's heaven, right? There's the spatial separation. So for Jesus here to be the key holder, the one who holds the key to the abyss, or the key of David as it's used here, I think one and the same, tells us a couple of things. One, it tells us that Jesus has authority. We have encountered this all throughout the book of Revelation, that even while these tantrums and traumas, while these judgments on the world are happening, we still find Jesus reigning with authority. We never want to take Jesus off the throne. Jesus is there. That's why he's able to tell his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. It's because he's reigning that we have any ability to share the gospel, and for the gospel to go to the nations, and for people to have their hearts softened and turned to the Lord. So we find Jesus with authority. He has the key. Now, some people uh, who are of a different perspective than me, they have a real problem with the way uh, we talk about Revelation chapter 20. We've kind of touched on that a little bit. And they say, how, how can you say that Satan is locked in the abyss? I believe that represents the time now. Satan is locked in the abyss. They say, look around, look around at the world if Satan were locked in the abyss and Jesus was reigning with authority, is this the kind of things you would expect to see? And it's my opinion that uh, usually that's because uh, a literal reader of, of Revelation is forcing a literal interpretation on me, okay? What, what they understand the abyss to be and what locked in the abyss means, that, that means put away in the most literal sense, locked behind a door, not to be seen or heard from. For me, abyss, and in the sense of the word in the Greek, is a little bit more loose. It just means limited. It just means lower. 
And so kind of like we encountered this morning in chapters 12 and 13, Satan is hurled down. He has lost. He's, he's in the abyss, but he's hurled down to the earth. So the distinction I would make is the abyss just means limited, lost and losing, no authority. It doesn't mean Satan doesn't have activity on the world anymore. It doesn't mean that we don't encounter evil. Of course we do. Of course we do. But it does mean that the, that the power and authority that at one time was granted to Satan as deceiver of the nations, the nations were deceived, Israel was not, that power and authority has been taken from him. And so the gospel can go to all the nations. We also find a, a, a limit in demonic activity now compared to what Jesus encountered during his time on the earth. I believe the gifts uh, have not ceased, that they're for today, that, that people have different spiritual gifts, but we don't encounter the, the same amount of, of possession or oppression or, or magic arts and stuff like this that Jesus did. Well, that's because demons are in the abyss with Satan. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It doesn't mean they don't have any activity on the world. It just is a, a, a picture, a symbol of their limited power. Their limited power. It's interesting that in this occasion, it's the key of David. Now, this, I think, is actually really important, and we're going to draw this out when we get to Revelation chapter 20 in the morning sermon series. Why the key of David? Well, Jesus is in the line of David. We know that. He's going to be a king like David. Can we think of any other kingdom? So, so let me just say how I'm thinking about the kingdom of God. Sometimes we describe the kingdom of God as the already but not yet. Anybody heard that before? Already but not yet? Which means he's reigning now with authority, but we haven't seen all the consequences play out yet. He's already reigning, his kingdom has come, but we haven't seen it in its fullness. Now think of one who would be a king like David in David's line. How does David's kingdom begin? Isn't it kind of the same? He's anointed as king, and he's leading a, a people, even while Saul is kind of fading out. David is God's anointed king, even if, even if Saul is, is sitting on the throne in Jerusalem and David's running around in the desert hiding, David's still the Lord's anointed king and slowly pushes it out until it comes in all its fullness. And he's later uh, anointed by the people on a separate occasion. And Jesus is a king very much like David. He's been anointed, he's ascended, he's, he's reigning now, even if it's outside Jerusalem. And eventually, that kingdom begins to more and more overtake the kingdom of this world. And that's the consummation when he comes again. So very interesting that, that he has authority, the key holder, much like the authority that was given to David. Exactly what we would expect on a king that's going to be a king like David or in the line of David. But then it says, uh, what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Well, we've heard language like this before. Actually, Jesus talks about the keys to the kingdom with his disciples. And he tells them, what you bind, no one can loose. And what you loose, no one can bind. Just a different way of saying exactly what we find here. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. So we get an idea of the kind of authority that Jesus has. It's not partial authority, though we only see his kingdom in a part. He really is the Lord's anointed, reigning with authority now. And he grants that power to his people, that we have the keys of the kingdom to bind and loose, right? Because we're co-heirs, we're, we're participators in Christ's kingdom, even if we haven't seen it in all its fullness in the world. Right? We still see problems, we, we still see judgments, sin is still at work, Satan is still at work. But we are, we are part of the people who have the authority granted to us by Christ who, who are, are, are pushing that out, the hands and feet of God in the world. So he, he shares those keys with us, the keys to the kingdom. And then closes there at the end of that. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. 
And that tells us a little bit something about the, the church and God's providence over our salvation. That if God has placed a door open for us, the defeat of the devil is so sure that he cannot close the door to the kingdom for us. What Christ has opened, no one can shut. Right? That, that's the assurance of salvation that we have as people of this kingdom. There's going to be no change. That's the finality of the cross. Yes, Satan still has some activity, but he has no authority. No authority. Moving on to this next section. I know that you have little strength, that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So we encountered the synagogue of Satan one other time. We talked about uh, the ways that the Jews sometimes would avoid persecution by joining ranks with the Romans and they would inform on Christians. Right? And so in that way, they would get in good graces with the Romans and, and, and avoid some of the persecutions. And I passed out um, uh, the, the martyrdom of Polycarp and a couple different times the Jews are mentioned as the ones who are riling up the people to kill the Christians, the synagogue of Satan. We've also talked about this guy, Ignatius, an early church father who, who writes letters to many of these churches, and he wrote one to Philadelphia, and he's addressing this problem of false Judaism, people who claim to be Jews, but they're just sidled up next to Rome. And I, this is a really cool quote, that's why I included it. Better to hear talk of Christianity from a man who is circumcised than of Judaism from one who is not. So to be a Jew and not be circumcised is essentially saying a false Jew. They claim they're Jewish, but they're not, right? They may be by ethnicity, but they're doing none of their religious stuff. They claim to have some authority over you because they're a Jew. Better hear talk of a Christian who's circumstances circumcised than a, than a Jew who's not. I always thought that was interesting. Uh, moving on. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. To him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Here we get more evidence of this idea of increasing tribulation that there is an hour of trial, right? And these people obviously avoided it because we haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that increasing tribulation come. And so the Lord has blessed them that way. Never again uh, will he leave the temple of my God. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him a new name. He was an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now we have this idea of this kingdom coming in its fullness. He begins the letter to Philadelphia with the key of David, right? He, he is reigning with authority, and eventually we see the culmination of that kingdom come when Jerusalem comes to earth. Again, very much like the way that David's kingdom began, where he's reigning, although he's running away outside of Jerusalem, and eventually that anointed king is brought into the promised land, brought into Jerusalem. And we expect Jesus to come in very much the same way. That when he returns, there's a finality to his return. He returns with heaven, with Jerusalem. 